All right, no, the two style. Now we, we usually love the two style. Now they're in this heart triad, and what do we already know about the heart triad? We already know that they're thinking in terms of relationships to be made, right? And they're gonna be processing in terms of their emotions or their feelings. They tend to be asking the question, who am I? And they're trying to resolve this primitive emotion Am I adequate enough? Am, am I sufficient enough? Because I'm feeling I'm not quite sufficient enough. So the way the twos go about presenting themselves is they love to serve. Remember that word serve. They love to serve. They love to give. It's kind of like they're orientated to nurture, to support, to affirm, to encourage. To, to love. They just love well. In other words, they can actually meet with you, listen to you, and the way they're listening to you, they're anticipating what you might need, and then they're going to, in, if they're resourceful, in a very helpful way, respond to your need, and you're going to feel, that, that was wonderful. That was really helpful. That was kind. That was generous that was supportive, that was nurturing, that was affirming, that was encouraging. And style two, they do that kind of stuff like falling off a log. Now the other styles, not, not so much. But the two style, if you will, is the most empathic of the styles. In other words, they're kind of capable of reading what's going on emotionally resourcefully now, and they kind of respond in ways that help you feel like someone's with me, caring for me, helping me, and encouraging me. If, if you're married to a resourceful too, you thank God, like every day. If you have a resourceful too as a friend, you thank God every day. Because you know what? They do stuff for you and they don't ask for things in return because they love serving. They love giving. Any two, um, we'll just put you on the spot. Any of those, how many of you have two as your highest total score? Oh, wow. Wow, that's quite, quite a few. How's this resonating, what he's saying? 100%. Yeah. How many, how many had plus 60 in this score? A lot more. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, thank God I want to come to this church. <laughs> you know, be cared for. Um, twos just do this kind of caring. Now, the, what the Enneagram is saying, this profile is saying, that's the resourcefulness. Now, when you think of that resourcefulness, will that create issues relationally? If it's resourceful. If it's resourceful, what I describe, someone who encourages and affirms and serves and cares for and loves with appropriate boundaries, does that create relational struggles? No. It's kind of, it's delightful. Now, what happens if that caring, nurturing style gets exaggerated and is overplayed. What does it look like? Well, it can look like codependency, but it looks very pragmatic. It starts to become annoying. It feels intrusive. Let, let me help you. No, you really look it. You really don't even know what you need, but I do. I know what you need, so let me help you. Can I care for you? Well, I know you said no, but you need me to care for you. Let, let, me, let me help you. So they, they ring your doorbell and you pull back the curtain and you say, they're here again. <laughs> It, it, sort, it sort of feels like they, they kind of have a hard time not taking care of you, not helping you, not supporting you, not loving you, 
not nurturing you. Now, the reason that is so is because the non-resourceful too has become defined externally. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that they look, the two has a tendency to look out on the world and to see how can I help. But if that gets exaggerated, I now look out on the world and say, how can I help so that I can be a me? Now, if we look out on the world and say, how can I care for you, love you, support you, affirm you, encourage you, in order for me to be a me, now I'm being defined externally, and I need you in order for me to be a me. And so the, when we work with persons that have high non-resourceful too, the question we're going to ask them is this question. And if you have high non-resourceful too, it's your dominant style, you need to ask, ask yourself the question, what do I need? Now, typically when we ask a non-resourceful to that question, they will say to us, would you please repeat the question? Because I don't understand. So we're simple guys, so we repeat the question. What is it that you need? Because the non-resourceful to personality has lost touch with their interior world and what they need. And as a result, they've lost appropriate boundaries relationally, and they are exaggeratedly involved in caring for and helping and nurturing, and the persons they're doing that with don't even want them to do that. So what that does, it sets up a bit, bit of tension relationally and then the non-resourceful too is prone to get frustrated and anyone want to take a guess? Angry. And then if they get angry, they're going to go away. And that's what's surprising. What's surprising, you see, is this too was so involved, nurturing, caring, supporting, loving, helping, uh, and just serving, and then suddenly... They're gone. Oh, has, has anyone seen Mary? You know, I, I've texted Bill, I've emailed Bill, I've called Bill, and Bill's totally non-responsive. Now, what do you think has happened? Somehow, Bill or Mary got the message that their caring isn't enough. And what did that activate in them? Anyone guess? Shame. shame. And what does the shame lead them to do? Go away. And that's a relational dynamic that happens when we're dealing with exaggerated two styles. And, it, and frankly, because the church can say, we need you to be a servant, and you really need to die to yourself. A non-resourceful two shows up and says, I can do that. That, that's right in their wheelhouse. And so the, the message sometimes can be interpreted as encouraging and nurturing, non-resourceful too. And then people get frustrated and angry in the church of Christ, and then they go away because their shames got activated. But what wasn't realized is that they're dependent on their caring and nurturing to be a self, and they're not depending on their internal relationship with Christ as the essential formation of their personal identity. One of the messages we say again and again and again, who you are is within your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want to know your true self, it will be found in communion with the living God. It will not be found in your performance. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this poem while he was in prison, Who Am I? And he struggled. He was a servant guy. He had a lot of two stuff in him. But at the end of this poem, Who Am I? Dietrich Bonhoeffer's last words were, Whoever I am, O God, you know I am thine. You know I belong to you. And for the two personality, it's really important for them to realize that it's not in my serving that gives me my essential identity. It is in my communion and my participatory relationship with Christ that gives my essential 
identity. And that's true for all the styles. So questions you have about the two style. It's important for the two style to set boundaries. <clears throat> we typically say if you have high non-resourceful two, the number one thing we would encourage you to do, if that's your primary area God's inviting you, is to start asking the question, what do you need? And how you begin to take time to nurture your own soul. Because it's not about caring for all those other people and all those little kids and your relatives and your mother-in-law and your uncle or whatever. It's about how you can begin to start nurturing and setting boundaries for yourself. So this is what you need to do. You need to commit yourself at least once a week. You're going to take two to three hours and you're going to focus on being alone and you're going to get out of the house and you're going to spend some time just reflecting and thinking, what is God inviting me to know about who I am in my relationship with him and how I can be more balanced within myself? That's for the two style. Any questions, any thoughts or reflections on this particular style? Yes, ma'am. If you live with a non-resourceful two, how do you get them to stop? How do you get them to stop? <clears throat> if you live with a non-resourceful two, how do you get them to stop? <laughs> Ask them to move out? <laughs> no, that's a joke. See, some of our material's not good. <laughs> Um, how do you, you ask, you, you, you tell them, I don't, you have to set boundaries with them. Yeah, that's a, no, that's a really good question. Now, will some people get it? Some non-resourceful twos will not get it, so they're going to keep ringing your doorbell. So don't answer. I mean, it, it's, you, sometimes you have to be really firm with non-resourceful twos because they can be very disruptive and they can be very intrusive in your life. And we have to say, no, I, I don't need you to help me that way. And does that create some tension and conflict initially? But if I understand I'm centered and I understand what's happening dynamically, relationally, I can set the boundary. It doesn't mean I'm gonna go away. I'm just setting a boundary. I don't need your help on this, stop. I need you to stop. And we were very firm about saying, please stop. Yeah, that not easily done. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Well, our our conviction is here's a fundamental convic conviction we have in working with every human being that comes to see us. And that is we believe every person has unique gifts from God. And when we're listening to someone's story and we ask them, please tell us your story. We're listening to how God has gifted them. We know their profile. How has God gifted you? And then we're gonna speak words to them of their gifting. We're gonna speak words of what it is God may be inviting them to live into. Because the deeply shame-based person feels there's nothing about me that's worth giving. That's what's going on. And we're saying you must begin to re resist that lie that's emotionally based within you. And you must begin to think. Now emotions are changed by cognition and behavior. And that means it's changed by the way we think and the way we act. That's how God's helped us change exaggerated emotions. There, there's a book to read called Calming the Emotional Storm that addresses this. I forget the author's name. It's not a Christian book, but who cares? We, we, we plunder Egypt's gold. So what we're doing here, we're, we're, what has God given us? He's given us the capacity to feel, to think, and to, be, and to act volitionally. So we're going to have a strategy. We're going to go to this person, we say, we need you to start believing something that's truer about yourself. Are you willing to believe something truer about yourself? Now, if they're not willing to believe something truer about themselves, we have to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you because we can't help you become not a victim. If you want to be a victim, you're stuck. 
Christianity is a faith that moves us beyond victimhood because it says the power that's work in us is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's pretty significant stuff. That's our conviction. So we believe whatever the malaise might be emotionally or behaviorally, there's a possibility for transformation. It can happen. We believe that deeply and we're going to bless people with a sense of their gifting and call them, are you willing to live in that? And then we're going to set some specific things for them to do to live towards it. Long answer to your question. Yes, ma'am. There's, there's certainly, or usually, there's a trend in childhood to over-identify with a gift. The parent, the, mo- the mother of three or four says to Susie, the oldest, and she means it as a compliment to Susie. Susie, I, I couldn't do this without you. You're such a big what to me. You're such a helper to me. Thank you. And what does lo- little Susie say? Ah, mom's just told me how I can belong in this family and be loved. I'm going to help. Now, that's good. It's just then, you know, 30 years of that, I get over-identified by saying, I am a helper. And when you don't want my help, that's saying something about me that I don't know how to help you well. Else you would want my help. Because Mama told me it's really a help for me to be a helper. And that's why, interestingly, the, each, of the, each style has a vice and a virtue. The vice of the two is pride. Not in the sense of, oh, look at me, how big and well, you know, grandiose I am. Although it, it could be that. But it's more in the sense of pride of, I don't have needs. Because if I have needs then I can't be a good helper to you, and that's where I'm finding my, mo- most of my identity. I don't have needs. So when Rich says, we ask the question, what do you need? They're saying, you know, they look at you like a deer in the headlights. Like, what is that about? And then they'll, you know, if they finally say something, they'll say, that feels like a real selfish question to ask. And it's the pride driving That response, like, I can't have needs. The rest of you are mortal. You know, I'm Messiah. That's why the virtue is humility. And you see those in your notes. The vice, pride, the virtue, humility. Humility in the sense of, I can open myself up to be helped by others. I have needs. This, I think it's really, I think what Jim has just mapped out is exactly what goes on for persons that move into non-resourceful too. But to your question as well, there's another dimension of this. The reason we emphasize family of origin, because family of origin maps primary neurostructures on how we do relationships. And it really depends on kind, the kind of messaging I received, and Jim mentioned this. What's the nature of the messaging I've received in my family system? And the nature of that messaging in my family system may well be a messaging that basically is shame-based. Now, that's pretty painful to get get our handles on. But sometimes we're driven to overshare because we're trying to avoid some pain within us because it's easier to overshare than to address the pain of betrayal of people who shamed us when we were little children. Remember, a lot of our exaggerated, non-resourceful stuff comes out of our woundedness. And we're trying to use our style to compensate for deep wounds. Remember this. You don't heal wounds by repentance. You repent of sin, right? But you seek healing for wounds. When Jesus came to save us, he came to save us from our sin through repentance. But he also came to save us from the consequences of being sinned against. And sozo in the Greek means that he comes to save us from sin and to heal us from having been sinned against. 
And that's very true in our family, many family systems. So we're not interested in people focusing on symptomology that may be sinful. We're inter- that's a result of woundedness. We're interested in them focusing on the wound to be healed and the symptomology will go away. So good question. There were a couple other questions that were here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I, I, my, my first take, my first take is I would want to challenge you to start looking internally. What is God inviting you to know about you internally instead of looking externally? And depending on some other numbers, that might be. But a high non-resourceful two style is a light is a, is an indicator to us that this person is too externally defined and therefore has less clarity about their own internal sense of self in Christ. And we want them to work on their own internal sense of self in Christ. You can begin by reading David Benner's book, The Gift of Being Yourself. It's 120 pages, a great little book, The Gift of Being Yourself. Focusing on what are my gifts and can I live out of my giftedness for God's glory? And that's really true humility. True humility is not self-deprecation. True humility is recognizing my giftedness and offering it to God for his glory and for our, my good and the good of those he calls me to love. That's true humility. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Congrats. Yeah, yeah. I think the, 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 the answer to your question is a relational answer. We find someone that I can say, this is what God is inviting me to. I see it. I see I'm overextended. I, I, you know, I have this wonderful gift. I love to help, but I just, I've gotten way overextended. I haven't had boundaries. I need you to help me with my boundaries. And you just... You work with someone that kind of a friend that kind of coaches you along until you get a year or two of momentum around setting boundaries, and we get we get some healthy habits going, and then then you find yourself in a better place. You usually can't do it alone. Basically, you you can't do it alone. You've got to have someone else. Now, who that what person may be, I just say it's someone who loves you and kind of understands you. And is kind of resourceful. Now I could say we fives, fives happen to be mine, you know. That's your husband? <laughs> yeah, he's see. Okay, what well, there you God go. Gave you, that's you why know? you got married to him, because yeah, fives right. can, five can say, um, you know, no, because fives can be very emotionally detached. Kind of. So they really don't, they don't even know there's feelings involved. <laughs> they they're not worried that. about feelings. They, they're unaware of feelings. Why? They don't even have to worry about them then. So listen to your five husbands. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> best way toward? <laughs> best be- What's the best way for a non-resourceful nine to resolve conflict with a non-resourceful two? (laughs) Hypothetically. Hypothetically. (laughs) Hypothetically. Well, Well, do it in the name of Jesus, whatever you do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, one of the reasons we want to do this is kind of bring some clarity. You know, a non-resourceful nine's got to take some action, step up, 
and declare themselves. And the nine's got to learn to back off a little bit and not, not take care of so much the stuff. The two. A two, I'm sorry, the non-resourceful two. You got to back off a little bit. And so you kind of work at trying to find that happy medium and you maybe need to find somebody to help coach you in that a little bit if, if you're so inclined. If not, just, you know, like just pray to Jesus and ask him to help me. And uh, just if I become aware... I can start talking about this kind of stuff between us. And if we can get some clarity, we can shift it just a little bit. But the overintrusive personality will fuel someone else's passivity. Do you see it? So if I'm overly extending myself, I nurture someone's pulling away and withdrawing. So stop it. Say, I'm not doing that. I need you to step, what do you need? Non-resourceful too. What do you need? Declare it and ask the non-resourceful nine to step up. And the non-resourceful nine knows I need to step up, otherwise she's going to be too intrusive and that bugs the heck out of me or some other word. You know? So work at that simple dynamic of declaring what you need, non-resourceful too, stepping up, and we'll talk about the nine later yeah. on. The nine, the question for the nine is what do I want? Yeah. So what what do I want here? Well, don't be passive and sit on that. Declare it. Live toward it. Yep. Ben. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends, Ben. He might be an eight, so that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, if he's a two, you might have some little white water down the road. Start paying attention. The reason we teach this for parents is so they can start paying attention and get inklings of what their children's styles might be. And then I can manage my words, my conversations with them in ways that fit what's appropriate for the development of their styles. You know, I got a, I got a granddaughter, she's a, she's a five, she's an observer. She's, she, my daughter's going crazy because she, she doesn't step in, dad, she doesn't step in. I go, she's not gonna step in, she's a five, she's gonna observe, she's gonna, figure it out, and then she's going to step in. So relax. She'll be okay. She's a real smart kid. But if you know the styles a little bit, it's kind of helpful. There was one other question. Then we got to get on to the three style. Was there another? Did we answer that question? Oh, you had a question. You just remembered. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you start that journey. Yeah. You, think, you think of your transformation not as an end game, but as a journey. So you're starting the journey to discern, what do I need? I don't need that. Well, good, you eliminated that. Well, what do you need? You start working that internal orientation about what is it is you need. Look at Jesus clearly had needs. I mean, after he feeds the multitude, he doesn't say, okay, boys, let's form small groups. He says, we're out of here. And he goes alone. To be, he had a need to be alone, to gather himself, to pray, to nurture his relationship with the Father. That was, he was attending to his internal needs. So a lot of us can kind of be foggy bottom about what in the world do I need? I haven't even thought about that in 10 years, or maybe five. Well, it begins a journey of discerning what is it, what in the world do I need?